Dialectic of Defeat, Contours of Western Marxism by Russell Jacoby, Chapter 2, The Marxism of Hegel and Engels. Unorthodox Marxism is unthinkable without Hegel. The irreplaceable starting point or starting and returning points for surpassing conformist Marxism are found in Hegel. From Gramsci to Marlowe Ponty, Marxists escape the constraints of orthodoxy by tapping Hegelian waters. Critical Marxism obtained coherence and significance in countries where Hegelian thought remained alive, Italy and Germany. Conversely, where Hegelian tradition never rooted, dissipi dissipated or arrived late in the United States, England, France, Orthodox Marxism not only dominated but suffocated alternatives. Yet this assertion is too crude and requires qualifications. Apart from the difficulty of identifying, identifying national traditions of Marxism, the relationship between Hegel and a critical Marxism explodes a simple cause and effect. Diverse schools of Marxism have appealed to Hegel. In the 19th century, Russian Hegelianism was second to none. In the 20th century, Soviet as well as European Marxism rest on Hegelian bases. Yet, a pattern emerges that is more than a pattern. It illuminates the logic and essence of Marxism. The Hegel that has informed and sometimes decorated Marxism has been divided into two types. Two Hegelian traditions crystallized and each infused two major Marxisms of the 20th century, Soviet and European. The failure to discern the two Hegelian traditions obscures the history of Marxism, partly because of the division of intellectual labor. The distinction between the two Hegels has rarely been studied. Russian specialists regularly concluded that Soviet Marxism is Hegelian in form and inspiration. Conversely, a specialist, uh, conversely specialists of European history argued that Western Marxism remains fundamentally Hegelian. These judgments are accurate, but imprecise and unilluminating. Soviet and European Marxism relied on antagonistic Hegelian traditions. This is more than an interesting or uninteresting fact. The interpretation of Hegel is an index to the history of Marxism, and it is a source. Marx arrived at his own theory by way of Hegel. The interpretation of Marx by subsequent Marxists was decisively colored by their reception of Hegel. The issue is not arcane or scholastic. The goal is not to discover when, where, and who read each text of Hegel, nor is the issue which tradition read Hegel more accurately. Rather, the task is to broadly characterize the Hegelian literature. Two traditions can be identified, the historical and the scientific Hegel. Each prized different texts and opposite formulations from the oeuvre of Hegel. The historical Hegelians gravitated toward the Hegel of history, subjectivity, and consciousness. Their preferred text was the phenomenology of mind. Hegel was the philosopher of the subject attaining consciousness through history. The scientific Hegelians valued Hegel as the comp comprehensive and scientific philosopher. They elevated the total system, the laws of development and the formality of the dialectic. They preferred the science of logic. The Hegelians tended to divide, as did the Marxists, over the interpretation of nature. Hegel himself developed a philosophy of nature that sought to confirm dialectical movements in pure chemical and physical nature. Its details are not important here, but this philosophy of nature demonstrated to the scientific followers the rigorous and universal method of Hegel. The laws of dialectics, valid not only in history but in nature itself, proved the comprehensiveness of the system. Conversely, the philosophy of nature fared poorly with the historical Hegelians. They judged it at best irrelevant, at worst erroneous. These conflicting evaluations of Hegel's philosophy of nature permeated the Marxist controversy on the dialectic of nature. Soviet Marxists generally defended the dialectic of nature. The laws of dialectics were not confined to history, 
but were equally valid in nature. In the vocabulary of Soviet Marxism, as certified by Stalin, dialectical materialism was the world outlook of Marxism that encompassed nature. Historical materialism was a specific application of the principles of dialectical materialism to the phenomena of the life of society. To the Western theorists, by drowning Marxism in a universal system, the Soviets killed its essence. The search for general dialectical laws eclipsed the heart of Marxism, the revolutionary process grounded in the subject attaining the consciousness. These processes were unknown to nature. Engels's contribution shows convincingly that the issue did not simply divide along national lines. The historical Hegelians predominated in Italy and Germany, and later in France. The scientific Hegelians held the edge in Russia. Yet Engels belonged emphatically in a scientific Hegelian camp. For this reason, Orthodox Marxism leaned heavily on Engels, while a Western Marxism critically re-examined Engels and his relationship to Marx. Russia yielded a rich variety of Hegelians. By 1840, when Hegel had been established in Russia, Ivan Kerevsky, who had attended his lectures in Germany, commented acidly that in Russia, even the 10-year-olds speak the language of Hegel. The study of Hegel led to widely divergent conclusions, spanning Vissarion G. Belinsky's brief reconciliation with reality and Michael Bakunin's subversion of reality. To me, wrote Belinsky, it, Hegel's philosophy, was the liberation. I understood that there is no such thing as savage material force. There's no ar arbitrary power. Nothing happens by accident. Several years later, Bakunin wrote, contradictions have never been so sharply presented as now. The spirit of revolution is not subdued, it is borrowing, if I may avail myself of this expression of Hegel's, like a mole under the earth. Initially, Hegelian philosophy lacked emphatic connection to a specific cultural or political tendency. With each passing decade, however, Hegel was sucked into the century-long conflict between the Westernizers and Slavophiles. Russian Marxism itself emerged out of and against Russian populism, and the dispute between the Marxists and populists composed one chapter in the longer conflict between the Westernizers and Slavophiles. Essentially, the issue turned on the nature of Russian development. The Westernizers or Europeanizers argued, to cite Nicholas Berdyev, that the future of Russia lay in its taking the Western path. Conversely, the Slavophiles believed that Russia offered a special type of culture, a distinct Russian civilization. Hegel might seem extra extraneous to this controversy. Nonetheless, implicitly and finally explicitly, a conceptual issue coalesced that encompassed and defined Russian Hegelianism. The Westernizers and later the Marxists were drawn to universal categories of reason and development. These categories did not allow a special or unique role for Russia. They suggested rather a single developmental path shared by Russia and Western Europe. The Slavophiles and later the populists, on the other hand, cultivated the categories of individuality and subjectivity. These categories freed Russia from the fate of imitating a single and universal Western model. They permitted a particular and unique Russian development unknown in Western Europe. These conflicting imperatives controlled the reading of Hegel. Adherents and opponents defined themselves according to the value they bestowed on universal scientific categories. While sometimes passing through a Hegelian phase, the Slavophiles and the populists ultimately found Hegel uncongenial. Slavophiles who were attracted to Hegel, such as Kurevsky, finally rejected him. Hegelian rationalism was the enemy of all transcendence. They judged Hegel, the pan-logician, the rationalist, and the westernizer who sacrificed the individual and specific Russian virtues, 
the hope for the Slavophiles and populists. Hegel stated one Slavophile stands in opposition to the religious, civil, and intellectual life of our people. The impression that Hegel endangered the individual and unique Russian realities provoked his reject rejection from Belinsky to Mikhailovsky. Mikhailovsky. Conversely, the Westernizers and emphatically the Marxists discovered an ally in Hegel. He was considered a universal thinker whose philosophy was applicable to Europe and Russia. Toward the end of the century, this was the issue among Russian social thinkers, the nature of Russian development, its distinct or universal features, and the validity of Marxism to Russia. Philosophical categories were scrutinized for their receptivity to unique Russian development or to universal and ineluctable Western evolution. For the Marxists, Hegel already refracted through the Western Slavophile dialogue, assumed the role of the theorist of objective and universal development. The two major figures in this conflict were Nicholas Mikulovsky and Georgi Plekhanov. Mikulovsky, a populist and a critic of Marxism, defended individual ethical and moral choices. In this respect, he also resisted fatalism and determinism in social theory. It is not fortuitous that he dubbed his contribution subjective sociology and that the populists generally formed a subjective school of sociology. Miklovsky denounced a purely objective theory. As he argued in his What is Progress, the exclusive use of the objective method in sociology would be tantamount to measuring weight with a yardstick. Supreme control must be vested in the subjective method. Hegel, consequently, was judged the foe of the individual and an exponent of an oppressive objectivity. There is no system of philosophy which treats the individual with such withering contempt and cold cruelty as the system of Hegel. The substance of Plekhanov's reply to Mikulovsky was adopted and repeated by the first Russian Marxists. Unlike Mikulovsky, Plekhanov celebrated Hegel, commemorating him in the German Social Democrats' Die Neue Zeit. His full answer to Mikulovsky, the development of the monist view of history, reared, according to Lenin, a whole generation of Russian Marxists. Plekhanov accented the objective, deterministic, and universal qualities of Hegel and Marx. With Hegel, the accident of human arbitrariness and human prudence give place to conformity to law, i.e. consequently to necessity, or as he asserted in his polemic, the subjective method in sociology is the greatest nonsense. The Marxists gained the upper hand in their feuds with the populists. They were able to pin on Mikulovsky the charges of confusion, idealism, and vacillation while claiming to be scientific and objective. Subjective wants and desires for the future of Russia did not count. It was objectively developing toward capitalism, argued many of the first Russian Marxists, including Lenin. Inasmuch as this was already a chapter in the longer exchange between the Westernizers and Slavophiles, the Marxists were more than ready to stress objective, scientific, and universal categories. For the Russian Marxists, the term subjective was irrevocably tainted by its association with the populist argument for a non-Western and non-Marxist future for Russia. Soviet Marxism inherited and augmented the distrust of subjectivity. The Soviet version of Marxism as a scientific and unified theory encompassing society and nature was prefigured in the response to Mikulovsky. For Mikulovsky, in accord with his concern for subjectivity and the individual, separated society from nature. He complained that the positivists, positivists devalued the individual by deploying methods appropriate for biology and chemistry. The rejoinder by Russian Marxists defended the continuum of nature and society. They considered this the test of the rigor and objectivity of a science. A reading of Hegel, science and subjectivity took shape that was the inverse of the European tradition. The reception of Hegel that imprinted European Marxism sharply diverged from the Russian.
By the last quarter of the century, the Hegelian tradition had dissipated, especially in Germany. Marx averred in 1873 that he was a pupil of that mighty thinker because Hegel was currently treated as a dead dog. Nearly everywhere, Hegel had been supplanted by positivism, social Darwinism, or neo-Kantianism. Within a weakening Hegelianism, Italy could boast the most visible and forceful representatives. Karl Rosenkranz, one of Hegel's German disciples, noted with astonishment in 1868 that although Hegel has, is considered obsolete in Germany, he comes to life again in the Italian language. The study of Hegel flourished in Naples, where Antonio Labriola, the first Italian Marxist, received his education. Years later, in 1894, Labriola asked Engels for a copy of the rare The Holy Family, Marx and Engels' polemic against the young Hegelians of the 1840s. After reading it, Labriola wrote to Engels, it recalled, the Hegelians of Naples among whom I lived in my earliest youth, and it seems to me that I understood and appreciated that book more than others. I also lived in my young days, as it were, in such a training hall, and I am not sorry for it. Labriola's teacher, Bertrando Spaventa, perhaps the most original of the, ne the Neapolitan Hegelians, offered a politically acute reading of Hegel. As Spaventa explained in his first important writing, Studies on the Philosophy of Hegel, 1850, while Hegel's philosophy was dead in France and Germany, it was spreading in Naples despite opposition from police and clerics. So for Spaventa, Hegel's philosophy opened a route toward national independence and revolution. In words that recalled a text by Marx he did not know, Spaventa argued that Hegel's philosophy was the intellectual arm of the national revolution. If material force sufficed to fight the foreign invaders of Italy, the Austrians, it did not suffice to surmount the cultural and religious domination of the Pope, cardinals, and priests. If the musket is necessary to destroy the former, it will not suffice to annihilate the latter. The Hegel of Spaventa was the Hegel of consciousness and the dialectic of subjectivity. The strength and the weakness of Spaventa and an entire Italian Hegelian tradition resided in concentration on subjectivity. Yet the charge of subjectivism leveled against Spaventa forgets that he cut his subjectivism from the same cloth as did Marx. Man makes himself what he is, wrote Spaventa. His world, his knowledge, and his happiness, all which he is as a man. His own work. It or is his own work. In general, this is the significance of the great concept of work and history, which are fundamentally the same. Like many of the, the Western Hegelians, Spaventa was drawn to the phenomenology of mind as the real light of the whole system. The categories of consciousness, subjectivity, and history move to the fore. Knowledge is generally inexplicable, impossible, if the spirit Subjectivity is simply a spectator. Knowledge is essentially self-knowledge. National traditions alone cannot unravel the history of Hegelianism and Marxism. The rupture between the historical and scientific Hegels did not simply correlate with national traditions. It also took place within an Italian framework. If Spaventa and his circle proved more important and enduring, Initially, an orthodox school of Hegelians represented by the Italian Augusto Vera enjoyed a far wider reputation. Vera, an enthusiastic Hegelian, was responsible in Italy, France, and England for innumerable commentaries on and translations of Hegel, including one published in the United States by the St. Louis Hegelians. His productivity and single-mindedness earned him broad recognition. Rosencrantz considered him the most rigorous systematizer of Hegel. For Vera, the system was the beginning and the end of Hegel, the absolutely vital element. That the phenomenology preceded the system was a subjective and accidental fact. The system was primary. Vera wrote in his French translation to the phenomenology that, 
The system is everything. Not the phenomenology, he argued elsewhere, but the logic was the key to the whole system. Literal loyalty to Hegel's texts defined Vera's orthodoxy. He did not mince words. With Hegel, the circle of philosophy closed. To comment mechanically on Hegel's deductions was all that remained for philosophers. Spaventa thought this criminal. In true, uh, in true philosophers, there is always something more than themselves. This is the germ of a new life. To mechanically repeat a philosopher amounts to suffocating this germ. That Spaventa and Vera sharply differed on the validity of Hegel's philosophy of nature is hardly surprising. For Spaventa, it was replete with faults, mistakes, and erroneous affirmations. These objections were resolutely rejected by Vera, who defended the systematic unity of nature. Even Rosencrantz, who lauded Vera as the sole philosopher to examine Hegel's philosophy of nature, was stirred to question his defense of Hegel's views on astronomy and Newton. The Neapolitan Hegelians prepared the grounds for an Italian Marxism, which runs from Spaventa to his student Labriola and from Labriola's student Benedetto Croci to Gramsci. These Italians concentrated on the categories of history, subjectivity, and consciousness, and they regarded with suspicion a positivist inclination to interpret Marxism as a universal and scientific system. Labriola criticized Plekhanov on exactly this point. This arrogant way of speaking of science will make scientific socialism laughable before the whole world. The guilt resides in the fact that many people look upon Marxism as a new kind of universal wisdom. The difficulty of characterizing Labriola's thought in a brief compass derives partly from its very nature. Because of his antipathy toward positivism and systems, Labriola was deliberately unsystematic and fragmentary. He preferred the informality of letters and teaching to professional monographs. One of his major works consisted of letters to Sorel. He explained, it has never been in my mind to write a standard book. I choose the form of letter because interruptions, breaks in the continuity of thought, and occasional jumps do not seem out of place and incongruous there. Or more emphatically, for 20 years, I have detested systematic philosophy. This attitude made me more apt to accept Marxism. The weakness, nearly the absence of an Italian Marxism in the 1880s, forced Labriola to discover and rethink Marx for himself. To do this, he mined his own Hegelian past and resources. In this sense, Labriola came to Marxism as Marx did, through German idealism. As he told Engels in 1894, he arrived at socialism by way of his rigorous Hegelian education. He did not learn about Marxism from the mouth of a great teacher. Marx's books were his only means, and even these were difficult to find. Only a single copy of Marx's critique of political economy could be located in Rome. His letters to Engels often complained of the dearth of Marx's texts in Italy. The timber of Labriola's Marxism resounded in his vocabulary. His terms testified to his efforts to distance himself from positivism and vulgar Marxism. Leary of the term science, he preferred critical communism. That is its true name, and there is none more exact for this doctrine, he said. He wrote to Engels of his misgivings about the terms science and Wissenschaft, for Engels, Wissenschaft implied a more profound, more organic, more complex meaning than the science of the positivists, which supplanted it in Italy. For the same reason, Labriola preferred genetic method to the term dialectical materialism. Dialectics in Italy had degenerated into rhetoric and sophistry. No one knows any longer the Hegelian, uh, the he the Hegelian tradition. In a similar vein, he protested the conventionalism and the stereotyped phrases that inflicted the socialist press. Labriola continuously resisted positivist and Darwinist, Darwinian Marxism. In 
He criticized the mania of Marxists who bring within the scope of socialism all the rest of science, and who chase after that universal philosophy into which socialism might be fitted as the central point of everything. Although he did not reject Darwin or evolution, he repudiate, repudiated the amalgam of Marx and Darwin. What a fine sight, materialism, positivism, dialectics, a holy trinity. If Marx and Engels respected Darwin, according to Labriola, they did not consider him the discoverer of the laws of entire humanity. Our doctrine must not be confounded with Dar Darwinism and it need not invoke a new fatalism or it need not invoke anew the conception of a mythical, mystical, or metaphorical form of fatalism. History, Labriola summarized succinctly, is the work of man. There are then no reasons for carrying back that work of man, which is history to the simple struggle for existence. Labriola's objections to semantic concessions to positivism were not misplaced. In the materialist conception of history, he discussed popular conceptions of causation in history, such as chance or determinism. He stated that these superficial approaches will dissolve as soon as scientific criticism appears. At least this is what his English readers think he wrote. Labriola did not use the term scientific here. He wrote that these superficial modes will vanish with the appearance of la critica della conoscenza, the critique of consciousness. Labriola's choice of words denotes the presence of the historical Hegel. His very first work, in fact, defended Hegel against Kant. To the end, he remained committed to a Hegelian core of Marxism, the idea of humanity producing itself through its own praxis. Among the theorists in the Second International, Labriola stood out as the sharpest critic of vulgar and positivist Marxism. The acuity of his judgment was honed on a Hegelian stone. He denounced the vulgar expounders of Marxism, who in reducing it to a simple doctrine of economic change, robbed it of its imminent philosophy. He stated in one of his best passages, Critical communism does not manufacture revolutions. It does not prepare insurrections. It does not furnish armies for revolts. It mingles itself with the proletarian movement, but it sees and supports that movement in the full intelligence of the connection which it has, which it can have, and which it must have with all the relations of social life as a whole. In a word, it is not a seminary in which superior officers of the pro proletarian revolution are trained, but it is neither more nor less than the consciousness of this revolution and especially the consciousness of its difficulties. By virtue of his late arrival to Marxism and his disdain for systematic writings, Labriola's major works were few and fell within a brief period. In memory of the Communist Manifesto, 1895, on historical materialism, 1896, and socialism and philosophy, 1897. He died in 1904. Yet directly and indirectly, Labriola inspired a Marxist literature that drew on the historical Hegel. Works on Marx soon appeared by Benedetto Croce, his pupil, and Giovanni Gentile. Although not a direct student, Gentile came under the sway of Labriola's teacher, Spaventa. In 1900, he edited the first of several volumes of Spaventa's writings. In a series of essays begun in 1896 and collected in 1900, Croce dissected the positivist reading of Marx. He launched into Achille Loria, who had been attacked previously by Engels. The determinist and evolutionary cast of Loria's theory deprived Marxism of moral and voluntary elements, rendering it quietistic. Loria failed to understand that Marx did not interpret history as an automatic process. Paul Lefargue, Marx's son-in-law, also found no favor with Croce. He charged that Lefargue reduced Marxism to a facile formula, opening it to ridicule. <clears throat> Much to Labriola's chagrin, however, Croce quickly distanced himself from his teacher's socialism. 
He chipped away at the conceptual status of Marxism, denying it was a philosophy of history. He preferred to call it a summary of new data, a realistic conception of history, or a canon of interpretation. By this, Croce sought to privilege ethics and morality by sharply separating them from Marxism. As a method of history, Marxism should not be confused with ethics and philosophy. Moreover, Croce attacked Marx's theory of surplus value, a term without meaning in pure economics. He told Gentile that he considered his own book a beer for Marxism. Croce's contributions severely tested his teacher's friendship, and Labriola dispatched a barrage of critical letters. He was incensed that Croce was drawn into the wider circles of Marxist revisionism, which was becoming public and menacing. For Labriola to check revisionism required increasing commitment and clarity. Furthermore, Labriola himself was, was distressed to be implicated insofar as he had been associated with both Croce and Sorel, another spokesman for revisionism. That Edward Bernstein could even, could even inquire whether he agreed with Croce shocked him. The intensity, or at least fragility, of positions adopted can be illustrated by Labriola's socialism and philosophy. This appeared, encouraged by, this appeared encouraged by Croce in 1897 in Italian as a series of friendly letters to Sorel. By the time the French translation had been prepared, the story had changed. Both Sorel and Croce had discredited themselves as revisionists in Labriola's opinion. Bernstein himself was referring to Croce as an ally. While Sorel was innocently, innocently suggesting to Labriola that Croce write the introduction to the French translation, Labriola penned a new preface and postscript. His letters to Sorel appeared in French in 1899 with a preface attacking Sorel and a postscript attacking Croce. Labriola charged Croce with the gravest sin in his code, scholasticism. The distinctions that Croce drew inside Marxism gratified only abstract logicians. There is a profound difference, he wrote to Croce, in considering science and philosophy as a task, a mission, a uh, Levens and Weltanschauung, and considering it simply as an intellectual pastime. Labriola heaped scorn on Croce's reply that he was uninterested in politics. Politics is 95% of Marxism. If Marx was only a professor, i.e. the other 5%, I would be as interested in him as much as I am interested in the logic of want. Gentile or genteel like Croce was primarily interested in the 5% of Marx. Although his later career is blackened by his association with fascism, his book on Marx was more provocative and original than Croce's. Even Lenin noticed and recommended it. The book of an Hegelian idealist, Giovanni Gentile, um, La Philosophia di Marx, Pisa 1899, deserves attention. The author points out some important aspects of Marx's materialistic dialectics, which usually escape the attention of the Kantians, positivists, etc. While Gentile was working on his book on Marx, he was also preparing a volume of Spaventa's writings. He was introduced to, to Spaventa's thought by his neo-idealist teacher, Donato Giaja. In reply to some hostile reviews when the volume appeared in 1900, he maintained, There is a tradition that we must take up again and develop if we wish to gain the right road, and that tradition is in the works of Spaventa. For Gentile, Spaventa developed a concept implied in the phenomenology. Knowledge is not simply knowledge, but knowledge is acting, working. This concept, which Bertrando Spaventa lucidly presented, is in our opinion the golden key to the new epistemology after Kant. It was also one of the most profound ideas of the most celebrated disciple of the philosopher from Stuttgart, Hegel, who in this respect was certainly unknown to Spaventa, Karl Marx.
Gentile challenged Croce's argument that philosophy was a secondary and extraneous addition to Marxism. Perhaps for this reason, Gentile won Labriola's approval. According to Gentile, Marx was a philosopher before he was a revolutionary. As a whole, his book on Marx represented a fusion of Feuerbach and Hegel. The subjective dialectic predominated. Marx's criticism of Feuerbach, he believed, served to distinguish a critical Marxism from a crude materialism. Gentile, in fact, was the first to translate into Italian Marx's theses on Feuerbach. The first and famous thesis presented the issue succinctly. The chief defect of all hitherto materialism, including Feuerbach's, is that the object, actuality, sensuousness, is conceived only in the form of the object or perception, but not as sensuous human activity, praxis, not subjectively. Gentile's philosophy of praxis returned to a Marxism that transcended flat materialism. The stock teaching that Marx substituted materialism for idealism slated the concept of praxis. Idealism furnished this concept, knowledge as subjective activity. Without it, materialism inclined toward passivity. To Marx, reality was a subjective product of man, that is, product of sensuous activity, not of thought, as Hegel and other idealists believed. Although broad intellectual and political relationships often misled, the fate of Hegel and Marx in France confirms a connection between a historical Hegel and a Western Marxism. In brief, a Western Marxism emerged only after a historical Hegel had struck a chord in French cultural life, and compared to Germany and Italy, Hegel arrived late. Loyal translations and forceful commentaries date only from the 1930s and 1940s. Jean Hippolyte's, or Hippolyte's translation of the phenomenology appeared in 1939 and 1941, and his commentary in 1946. Alexander Kochev offered lectures on Hegel in the mid-1930s, which he published in 1947. These efforts prepared the way for the most significant or the most public theorists of French Western Marxism, Maurice Merleau-Ponty and Jean-Paul Sartre. This is also an exaggeration that ignores the much earlier commentaries and translations of Hegel. Translations of Hegel's major works date from the 1860s and 19th century. France witnessed a number of efforts to introduce Hegel. These ran the gamut from the eclecticism of Victor Cousin to the orthodoxy of Augusto Vera. Each was seriously handicapped, however. A deficient knowledge of Hegel and of German characterized Cousin's lectures and writings. Rosencrantz, who gave Vera high marks, judged Cousin harshly. If Cousin had grasped Hegel more deeply and accurately, Rosencrantz stated, Hegel would have enjoyed more success in France. Vera represented the opposite weakness, extreme loyalty to Hegel with little originality. As mentioned previously, Vera, later an opponent of Spaventa, resided for years in France and completed some of the first French translations and extended commentaries on Hegel. He proclaimed that his life was dedicated to the triumph of Hegelian's philosophy. Later, Frenchmen found few triumphs. The translations made from German to French by this Italian were considered uncertain and his commentaries mediocre. More sympathetically, Vera has been judged unable to shake the indifference of the public nor modify its prejudices. After the demise of the weak 19th century French Hegelians, other currents and individuals can be charted that finally coalesced into a French Western Marxism. Lucien Hare and Charles Andler studied Hegel at the turn of the century. Subsequently, but prior to Kojev and Hippolyte, Jean, Jean Wall, André Breton, Henry Lefebvre, and Alexander Coiré presented Hegelian thought to a French public. Many of these formed a series of interlocking relationships. Wall inspired Hippolyte as well as Sartre. In 1930, 
Poiré himself addressed the question of why a Hegelian school had not been able to form in France. He also wrote on the Hegelian tradition in Russia and hoped to nurture a French Hegel Renaissance. When Quare was compelled to interrupt his course on Hegel, he asked Kojev to succeed him. In the 1930s, Lefebvre, with Norbert Guterman, translated Lenin's Hegel notebooks, Hegel's writings, and texts of the early Marx. They anticipated as well as participated in the post-World War II flowering of French Marxism. Nor should the serious interest of the Surrealists, especially Breton and Hegel, be slighted. You cite Hegel, Breton complained, and in revolutionary circles you immediately see brows darken. In the early 1930s, the Surrealists published selections from Lenin's Hegel notebooks, and a former Surrealist, Raymond Quinault, edited Kojev's lectures on Hegel. These individuals all turned to the historical Hegel while denigrating or ignoring Hegel's philosophy of nature. At the turn of the century, Lucien Hare, Charles Andler, and George Sorel represented weak versions of Labriola, Croce, and Gentile. These Frenchmen also retrieved the Hegelian dimension of Marxism, yet they had little to draw upon. By the 1890s, what existed of French Hegelianism had evaporated. The French were communicating with their Italian counterparts. However, Sorel and Labriola exchanged letters that were to constitute one of Labriola's books. Their friendship soon ended because Labriola decided that Sorel, perpetually shifting positions, was a psychiatric case. Croce, on the other hand, considered Sorel a kindred spirit and remained his regular correspondent. The few Marxist texts of this French circle displayed the same contours as the Italian contributions. They turned to the historical Hegel, and while recalling the subjective and philosophical spirit of Marxism, denounced its vulgar and positivist deformations. Er, whose influence on French socialism extended beyond his modest writings, wrote one of the few pieces on Hegel of this period, an entry in La Grande Encyclopédie. His major project, a three-volume study of Hegel, conceived in the late 1880s, remained uncompleted at his death in 1926. A draft of a preface for the second volume projected second volume projected following the development of the Hegelian school until nothing more exists which merits its name. An unpublished pamphlet from 1906, La Re Révolution sociale echoed themes of Western Marxism. Referring to Croce, Er criticized labeling Marxism materialistic and scientific. It is ut utterly exact that Marxism is scientific socialism, but it is necessary to, to define this scientific character. Marxism is knowledge of the law of the proletariat prise du dedans. It is the consciousness of the proletariat. If only because of his continuous revisions, Sorel is difficult to summarize. Like Gentile, he advanced a subjective critique of orthodox Marxism, and like Gentile's, it threatened to become exclusively subjective. He challenged Marxist determinism and pretense to science. Marxists have erred in establishing a scientific party. For Sorel, science and determinism overlapped. The fatalist prejudice, he wrote, in necessity and fa fatalism in Marxism derives in large part from the false idea of science formed by the socialists. Sorel's critique of orthodox Marxism, however, was rooted as much in Bergson as in Hegel. Through his correspondence with Cruce, however, he warmed to Hegel. By 1907, he affirmed that it was necessary to show the French public, which believed Hegel was dead and buried, that his theories were alive and active. Several years later, he agreed with Croce that Hegel had opened a new era.
In the 12 years that Engels survived Marx, 1883 to 1895, he assumed and completed an astounding number of tasks and projects. Contemporaries often commented upon his energy. Not only did he edit volumes two and three of Capital, provide endless advice and enter in theoretical debates about exchange value and profit rates, but he penned The Origin of the Family, Feuerbach and the End of Classical German Philosophy, and prefaces to Marx's Civil War in France and Class Struggles in France, 1848 to 1850. In the last five years of his life, Yvonne Kapp writes, Engels has some 100, 135 works of greater or less importance to his credit. These ranged from Volume 3 of Capital, which to all intents and purposes he may be said to have written from Marx's very rough first draft, draft and revisions of the English translation of Volume 1, to lengthy interviews, weighty articles, new prefaces, innumerable translations, many of which he supervised, an output that he himself at the age of 74 thought work enough for two men of 40. By virtue of his collaboration with Marx, his prodigious output and the lucidity and simplicity of his own texts, Engels enjoyed res respect and authority. He was only challenged, challenged sub rosa. Some of Engels's final letters pr protested the unauthorized editing of his new preface to Marx's class struggles in France. I appear as a peaceful worshipper of legality at any price, he complained. That Bernstein, an anointed successor to Engels, waited until Engels died to publicly challenge Marxism does not seem accidental. The texts of Engels became essential reading, and because of their brevity and clarity, they displaced the longer and more complex writings of Marx. Yet Engels illustrates and indexes two divergent traditions of Marxism, which in turn rest on contrasting interpretations of Hegel. It is not necessary to belittle Engels or saddle him with all the ills of later Marxism to recognize that as a popularizer of Marxism, he followed his own inclinations. Although Engels railed against dogmatic Marxism, especially in private letters, he publicly presented Marxism as a unified objective system encompassing nature and history. In brief, Engels stood firmly with a scientific Hegelian tradition. Attracted to the natural sciences, he sought to demonstrate the universal validity of dialectics. <clears throat> Engels said, What therefore is the negation of the negation? An extremely general, and for that reason extremely comprehensive and important law of nature, history, and thought. A law which, as we have seen, holds good in the animal and plant kingdoms, in geology, in mathematics, in history, and in philosophy. When I say that all these processes are the negation of the negation, I bring them all together under this one law of motion. Dialectics is nothing more than the science of the general laws of motion and development of nature, human society, and thought. <clears throat> A reliance on Engels marked Orthodox, especially Soviet Marxism. Engels legitimated Marxism as an objective and systematic science. The basic texts of Lenin, Stalin, and Mao drew almost exclusively upon Engels. Conversely, Western Marxists challenged Engels. They charged he misconceived the relation of dialectics and nature. The search for universal scientific laws swallowed the specific subjective moment of Marxism. To jump ahead, one heresy of George Lucas, or one heresy of George Lucas's history in class consciousness, lay exactly here. Lucas accused Engels of missing the essence of the dialectic method, namely the dialectical relation between subject and object in the historical process. In a footnote, Lucas elaborated, It is of the first importance to realize that the method is limited here to the realms of history and society. The misunderstandings that arise from Engels' account of dialectics can, in the main, be put down to the fact that Engels, following Hegel's mistaken lead, extended the method to apply also to nature. <clears throat> 
However, the crucial determinants of dialectics, the interaction of subject and object, the historical changes, etc., are absent from our knowledge of nature. Defenders of Orthodox Marxism rebuked Lucas with dispatch. They tolerated no breach between Engels and Marx. The parameters of this debate were continuously reestablished. Engels, scientific Hegel, and a dialectics of nature composed an orthodoxy that was committed to a universal and scientific Marxism. The unorthodox challenged Engels and rescued the historical Hegel. Lucas himself might not have been fully aware, and recent accounts of Marxism have ignored, that the critique of Engels did not commence in 1923 with history and class consciousness. Rather, the Italian and French Hegelians of the 1890s had already discussed and evaluated Engels' contribution. Moreover, this earlier critique may have been transmitted to Lucas by Irvin Sabo, a Hungarian Marxist, and Sorel, who were both important in Lucas's development. It may have been Gentile who first questioned at length Engels' distortion of Marx. Similar thoughts were echoed by Croce, Sorel, and Andler. By 1906, Croce had remarked upon the extended Italian discussions on Engels. In 1912, a, sub a substantial result of these discussions emerged. Rodolfo Mandolfo, Il Materialismo Storico in Frederico Engels. Oh, there's an English title. The Historical Materialism of Frederick Engels, which was a detailed analysis of Engels, contrasting his dialectical materialism with Marx's philosophy of praxis. Gentile challenged Engels' understanding and appropriation of Hegel. He cited Engels' pamphlet on scientific and utopian socialism, in which Hegel is criticized for failing to understand the objectivity of the world. In retort, Gentile charged that Engels demonstrated that he understood nothing of Hegel's subjectivity, nor did he understand that it was necessary to grasp the phenomenology before the logic. Writing to Jaja about this very issue, Gentile affirmed that although Engels might be a valiant economist, it was regrettable that he was celebrated as a great philosopher. Engels' anti during he argued elsewhere, never reached the genuine sources of Marx and never profoundly penetrated the philosophical part of the theory of his friend and teacher. Croce commented more prudently that treating Marx's and Engels' writings as identical was a mistake. The mental shape of Engels did not resemble that of Marx. Labriola, it should be noted, did not accept these critiques of Engels, perhaps because Engels had been a personal friend. I am such a cretin, he wrote to Croce sarcastically, that I do not see the difference between Marx and Engels. Searle belittled Engels freely in his letters and public writings. He wrote to Croce that it was certain Engels deviated from Marx and that Engels did not command an extensive philosophical background. He did not have very clear ideas, notably on Hegelianism. He has contributed a great deal in leading historical materialism down the path of evolutionism and making it an absolute dogma. Sorrell, Sorrell a former engineer, stated that Engel, Engels' ideas on science were vague. Referring to Engel, Engels' pamphlet on scientific socialism, he concluded, Thus, not much importance should be attached to the terms he uses. The expression scientific socialism flattered current ideas on the omnipotence of science, and it flourished. From this vantage point, Sorel denounced Lafargue, who also criticized, who, or also criticized by Croce as a disciple of Engels, not Marx. I believe that these ideas of Lafargue's are not at all Marxist, but it must be recognized that they are based on the principles posed by Engels. Sorel referred often in his letters to Charles Andler, a friend and a later biographer of Lucien Ayer. Like Ayer, Andler was conversant with German culture and philosophy. In 1897, he criticized in passing um, the term scientific socialism. In 
In 1901, he published a lengthy commentary on the Communist Manifesto. He ferreted out its French sources, and he argued that some incoherence of the text derived from divergences between Marx and Engels. In the mid-1890s, Andler offered a course on the decomposition of Marxism and planned a book on the same subject. The book never appeared, and Sorel took the term for his own in the decomposition of Marxism in 1908. A piece of the course on Engels appeared later, 1912 to 1913, subtitled Fragments of a Study on the Decomposition of Marxism. Andler admitted that although it might be strange to argue that Engels vigorously contributed to, to the decomposition of Marxism, since he has long been regarded as the most authoritative interpreter, his destructive influence on the doctrine is a fact. For Andler, Engels was the first disciple of Marx who presented Marxism not only as a subversive economic doctrine, but as a complete system of philosophy. Moreover, an industrial spirit permeated Engels, whereas Marx used terms such as class itself as a revolutionary force, Engels substituted productive forces. No one has manifested more ingenious dilettant dilettantism and all kinds of sciences than his founder of than this founder of scientific socialism. Apart from some isolated contributions, such as those by the Czech Thomas Masaryk, or the Pole Stanislaw Brzezowski, or the Hungarian Irvin Sabo, the most extensive critiques of Engels emanated from the Italians. Their criticism was primarily grounded in Feuerbach or in a reconsideration of the relationship among Hegel, Feuerbach, and Marx. This reconsideration formed the basis for the work of Gentile and Mondolfo, as well as for Arturo Labriola, no relation to Antonio. As noted earlier, Gentile translated Marx's theses on Feuerbach into Italian, and the accuracy of this translation informed the debate. Arturo Labriola, at that time a syndicalist and an acquaintance of Sorel, wrote the preface to the French translation of one of Sorel's books. His critique of Engels in Marx, in Marx on Economics and as Theorist of Socialism, 1908, was emphatically Feuerbachian. He cited the first thesis on Feuerbach and stated, here is the nucleus and the point of departure for all Marxism. For Arturo Labriola, capital itself was a gloss on Feuerbach. It is not surprising that the thesis on Feuerbach was the touchstone for these critics of Engels, inasmuch as the theses were directed against passive materialism or a materialism without a subject. It was a perfect foil to use against Engels, even though Engels himself had published them. Arturo Labriola drew the most violent conclusions about Engels. He judged that Engels possessed an intelligence of modest proportions. I seriously doubt whether he had understood the radical profundity of the thought of his friend and teacher. He even conjectured whether Engels was familiar with all the work of Marx. He charged that Engels reduced Marx to a natural science and he pondered the enigma of why Marx tolerated the, the adulteration of Engels. Mandolfo's discussion of Engels was more measured and sympathetic. Unlike Croce, Gentile, and Arturo Labriola, Mandolfo remained a lifelong socialist. Without doubt, he was one of the ablest theorists of the period. His starting point was also Feuerbach. His first writings on Marx, Feuerbach and Marx, 1909, examine their philosophical relationship. To understand Marx well, it is necessary to first directly grasp Feuerbach. Marx avoided the bad choices of fatalism and voluntarism through a critical, practical conception. From a critical consciousness of the social reality to historical pro uh, praxis, this sequence signals the supersession of the antithesis of voluntarism and fatalism. Mandolfo took revolutionary praxis from the theses as the vital concept fusing subjective and objective moments. Capitalism is not constituted solely of objective tendencies.
Mondolfo did simply de denigrate Engels in comparison with Marx. In response to a review, uh, review, he clarified that he separated the two thinkers to better demonstrate their essential identity. This was an overstatement. His study highlighted the deficiencies of Engels. To Engels's dialectical materialism, Mondolfo contrasted Marx's philosophy of praxis. According to Mondolfo, the initial problem for Marx was knowledge. For Engels, it was being. Consequently, Marx, departing from the critique of consciousness, moved toward a philosophy of praxis, while Engels, rooted in a natural philosophy, concluded with materialism. Much of the dogmatism and obscurity of Engels resulted from lacking the concept of revolutionary praxis. Anticipating Lucas's critique, Mandolfo analyzed Engels's mistake as repeating Hegel's, or Hegel's. <laughs> He drew upon Croce's What is Living and What is Dead of the Philosophy of Hegel, 1906, which devoted one chapter to the error in the concept of Hegel's philosophy of nature. For Croce, a philosophy of nature was a contradiction in terms. It implies philosophical thought of those arbitrary concepts which philosophy does not know and upon which it consequently has no hold. Engels, unable to escape this error, affirmed the natural and scientific reality of dialectics. To Mandolfo, Engels reversed Hegel while preserving the essential mistake. The Hegelian absorption of science by philosophy is transformed in Engels into the absorption of, of philosophy by science. When Hegel was lying on his deathbed, teased Heinrich Hein, he said, only one man has understood me, but shortly afterwards he added fretfully, and even he did not understand me. The history of Marxism does little to deflate the joke. Yet Hegel, misunderstood or understood, dogged and sometimes led Marxists. Theorists of Marxism did not arrive at Marxism cleansed of history and culture, or to borrow a phrase from Mao Tse's tongue, Marxists do not fall from the sky. They attained Marxism already tempered by their cultural past. This past included Hegelian thought and, more broadly, ideas of science, history, and the individual. The materialist doctrine that belittled the impact of ideas always demonstrated the opposite. The Hegel that lurked behind Marxism split into two traditions, scientific and historical. The distinct Hegelian traditions did not yield did not yield by themselves Soviet and Western Marxism. They performed and informed the ensuing Marxism. Soviet Marxism was regularly sustained by scientific Hegel, and European Marxism was regularly sustained by historical Hegel. Each demarcated a common terrain and language universal laws of nature and society, and historical processes of consciousness and action. In the revolutionary surges after World War I, the philosophical border between the historical and scientific Hegelians translated into a theorist, into a political fissure between Western and Soviet Marxism. The major theorists of Western Marxism, Lucas, Gramsci, and Korch, were drenched in German idealism and the historical Hegel. Later Western Marxists, Marcuse, Sartre, and Merleau-Ponty returned to Hegel to escape the constraints of Orthodox Marxism. Of course, philosophical issues were not always urgent, yet they were always more than an afterthought. They did not dictate politics, but sketched the possibilities and the hopes.